my plan tonight is to talk to you a little bit about um, stress and toxic stress and what is considered toxic to children's development in particular and about parent and relationships and attachment. We call these serve and return relationships. I'm going to talk to you about what that looks like and I'm going to walk you through a program called Keys to Caregiving which has been delivered to, oh gosh, hundreds of thousands of, of new families now um, to help them understand and respond to their babies unique language. So we'll end with that. And actually I'm kind of open if I'm not being clear, if, if you're confused with something or I, you want more information, I'm, I'm just wave your hand and I'm, I'm very happy to sort of stop and, and talk at that moment. I think it's better to be kind of contingent than wait till the end when a question might not uh, resonate so much anymore. All right, so the three core concepts of, of child development. We know now that brain architecture, the structures of the brain that set the the child, the person up for a life of learning and uh, functioning in society, is established very early on, between prenatal and, and age three, actually. And uh, that early brain architecture is what the child will rely on for their lifelong learning, behavior, and health. We also know that toxic stress, I'm going to tell you what that is exactly in a minute, but toxic stress in particular, not just stress, because there's stress that's good, but uh, toxic stress in the early years can actually derail child development and actually derail brain development in very um, observable ways. And then the third thing, and that's what I'm going to focus on the most, is about stable, caring relationships, serve and return interaction style. And I'll be talking more about this, but um, just to give you why we call it serve and return, it's kind of, it goes back to a tennis or a game, you know, catch, a game of catch that you would play. And someone is going to throw the ball or serve the ball, and someone is going to hit it back. And the baby is the one that's serving the ball or serving the the shuttlecock if you play badminton or whatever, and the adult is, is the one that's returning. So we talk about parent-child interaction now as serve and return relationships. This is where this term is coming from. It doesn't resonate so easily in some northern climates, but if you, you know, live in California or um, Massachusetts where the, the terminology is, has arisen, I think it makes a lot more sense. Everyone's got a tennis club membership, I guess. But um, uh, anyway, that's what serve and return relates to. And that is really important for shaping brain development and brain architecture. So let's talk about stress and toxic stress. And there's three types of stress. So the first type is positive. Well, there's positive, tolerable, and toxic. And the first type is positive. And positive stress is just maybe the stress you felt, for example, when you wanted to get here on time. You were, you know, had to rush around the house a bit, finish dinner, get the dishes in the dishwasher. That's your positive stressors. Those are the the things that we face every day that help us to function, then we need those stressors or else we probably just lie on the couch all the time. So, um, so it's positive, positive stressors. And as you're doing those things, you have you know, physiologic effects. You, know, you have brief increases in your heart rate. You have some mild elevations in, your, in the stress hormones that are circulating in your body at all times. And, um, and it's, that's normal, positive. And then we have tolerable types of stress. So this would be, for example, say you had a little, um, you had a little fender bender on the way to this meeting, something like that, like a, a, an acute stressor that's going to, it's a serious temporary stressor, you know, but it's, um, it's tolerable, particularly if you have supportive relationships. So that's, that's what we talk about as being tolerable stress. Now for a baby, a tolerable stress might be something like, say, uh, I'm having their immunizations, okay? It's an acute stressor, it hurts a lot, but you know, mom and dad are there comforting, and the bells are ringing, the nurses are bringing the bells or whatever, distracting the baby, and it's, it makes that stressor tolerable. Now, toxic stress is what we're really concerned about when it comes to, to babies' brain development. But you know, toxic stress is not just difficult for babies and a, a real worry for babies, but it's also it's a worry for all of us, you know. We know that uh, toxic stress is, has a, um, you know, all sorts of health outcomes for adults, but for babies, it's, it's sort of a, it's the, the chips are higher, let's say, because their brains are developing at the time they're being exposed to this chronic stress, and the stress hormones circulating in their body are such that it actually interferes with normal development and the, health, the brain architecture we want those, those kids to, to develop. And the one thing I wanted to say about the toxic stressors, as well as for the tolerable stressors, they're only toler you know, they're only at this level when they're in the absence of protective relationships or supportive relationships. So it's, it's sort of it's implicit here, but it's, it's really important implicit that we need to get as much support around us as we can, is that's going to help us um, deal with the stress, cope with the stress, and we use the term buffer the stress. And it literally does buffer how your body responds to stress.
when you have lots of people around to help. And if you're at my TED talk on Saturday, I talked a bit about that. So what are the sources of toxic stress in young children? These are the most common stressors in the US and in Canada, and I hope you can read the bottom. But the, you know, these are, so 75 per 100 children aged two to five are exposed to maltreatment uh, or, or exposed to family violence. And these are very consistent with Canadian numbers. And then about 198, it says here, um, one in 10 children are exposed to parents who have a substance abuse problem. And in Canada and the US, by far the biggest toxic stressor to children's development is postpartum depression. We know that about 13%, 130 out of 100 kids between the age of um, two to five are exposed to maternal depression. We also know that one in 100 out of 100, sorry, 100 of 1,000 children uh, have a father with postpartum depression too. And if you can, and you know, they're not always happening together. So a lot of kids are exposed to one parent with depression in Canada. All right. So those three toxic stressors, and, and actually I'll just go back for one second. I'm gonna talk about this a lot, but the reason why these things are toxic to children's development is because they interfere with those serve and return relationships I was talking about. When a parent's depressed, when a parent has a ab substance abuse problem, when a parent um, is exposed to family violence, or you know, another one is um, poverty, when they have a lot of things happening in their life that's just interfering with their ability to be sensitive and there in the present with their child, it interferes with the kind of relationship that the caregiver has with the baby, their ability to, be, to respond in a timely way to the child's needs, and that is stressful. That's stressful for babies. That's stressful, and that's what uh, we believe is what's interfering with brain development. So, so the early life experiences, there's so much evidence now coming from so many different places, but the early life experiences are built into our bodies for better or for worse. So research on, on adversity and those, that depression, that addiction, that um, violence, that poverty, those exposures I just talked about, that's adversity. The research on the adversity that children experience and you know, in childhood, infancy childhood, uh, has shown that it relates to heart rate increases, blood pressure increases, you have more serum glucose, more stress hormones circulating, more immune responses, that's the inflammatory cytokines. And all these things, when, you, when a child is exposed to a lot of adversity, it's fueling the fight or flight response, essentially. And uh, when the stress is unremitting, the child is constantly in that state of fight or flight. So the body is in a hyper-aroused state, and prolonged activation of those systems leads to long-term disruptions in brain architecture, so the, the structure of the brain, uh, immune status, metabolic systems, so the things like diabetes, cardiovascular function, and gene expression, which I'm gonna talk a bit about. My own research that we're, we're looking, we're following this line of thinking right now, but there's evidence to support that mothers who have postpartum depression are more likely to have children with asthma. And one of the theories behind that is that the mothers who have depression are not able to be, you know, be the good serve and return partners. They're not returning those lobs of those balls across the net from the child. And it's that's stressful for the child, and that's activating their fight or flight response, and that's what's predicting their likelihood of having uh, asthma. And we're, we're looking at that. There's no, there's no um, doubt that depression in a mother is highly predictive of asthma in children. It's not 100% guarantee, but you're more likely to have asthma in the child if mom's depressed. But what we don't really understand, what I'm looking at, is is it because of how the mother's interacting with the baby? And that's the theory right now. Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, more about adversity. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why this is becoming such a hot topic right now, and people are finally, I mean, I've been working on this for a long time, and lots of people have been working on it longer than I have, for sure. You know, we've been talking about the importance of, we called it parent-infant relationships for 30, 40 years, I mean, before, before I was born. And, um, but what's really making it of such great interest right now to policymakers and a whole lot of other people is that, they're finding that, yeah, those early relationships, they don't just relate to, you know, how well the child is in school or whatever, and that, which is what this is demonstrating. But as I'll show you in a second, it relates to a whole lot of longer-term health outcomes. So, when we, uh, so there's a, there was a study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which was the groundbreaking one in this area. And what happened was it was a, a study done in the U.S. It was through a, an HMO, one of those health maintenance organizations, and they just surveyed all the people that they had coming to their service. So it's like a, a bunch of physicians had clients, you know, and there were, some were ill, some were healthy, and just the whole range of people that, that are in a physician's practice. And they asked these people, about 60,000 of them, 10 questions. They asked them, did they have emotional abuse? Do they remember being emotionally abused as a child before the age of 18? 
they have experienced physical abuse, sexual abuse, so they have an experience of being unloved or feeling unloved or unsupported? Did they lack for basic needs uh, in that period of time? Were their parents alcoholics or did they abuse drugs? Did they, were their parents divorced? They talked about wife abuse in particular, not family violence, but was their mother or grandmother a victim of family violence? Um, were one of their parents depressed or one of the, were one of their parents imprisoned? So these are the adversities. So they asked these 60,000 people these questions and every time they said yes to one of these, they got a point. So the higher your score was, the worse your early life experiences were, the more adversities you had. And they call these ACEs. So the more ACEs that you had, adverse childhood experiences, the more ACEs you had, the more adversity you had. So this slide shows what they found. So when they looked at kids, adults, when they looked at, talked to adults and they found out that they had only one or two adversities that they reported before the age of 18, their likelihood of, of also being a child with developmental delay was, you know, around 5%. But as the, the, as the adults reported they had more adversities in their childhood, their likelihood of reporting that they also were just, um, identified as having a developmental delay went up. So it's a you know, linear relationship. So this was kind of stunning for people, but at the same time, yeah, okay, early adversity affects development. We kind of we wasn't so compelling because it didn't really address the lifespan perspective. And what they also, these were adults, right? So they also asked these adults about, and they had all this data on them, like, you know, are they treated for diabetes? Are they on medications for mental health problems or whatever? And so, and there's tons and tons of data. But what they found is that the more adverse experiences the adults reported, the more likely in this case, they were to be at risk of depression in adulthood. The more likely in this case, they were to report that they had heart disease. And there's so, you can just Google ACEs and you can come up with, there's hundreds of these slides like this and I could have pulled up those for suicidality, for marital breakdown, for diabetes, for um, asthma, allergies, lupus. Like, the more adverse early childhood experiences you, ex you had, the more likely you are to have health problems mental and physical over your lifespan. So this was just this big uh, wake up call to policymakers who've been you know, interested in parenting and child development and oh yeah, it's feel good, get them ready for school. But this is way bigger than getting them ready for school. This is getting them ready for life in a society and has implications for healthcare costs and, and um, all, sorts of, all sorts of costs to society.